I guess a lot of this, in a way, is time sensitive. So it depends if I'm thinking about when I first began getting involved with clay, which would have been over 40 years ago when I went to Japan and started studying. That was one thing. Or now, um, working in the environment I'm in now in upstate New York, um, I consider myself more of an artist uh, now. When I came back from Japan, more of a, not a production potter, but I was making tableware and um, you know, useful pieces. Um, so what inspires me, I guess, at the time, certainly nature, formations in nature, stone. I love to look at different kinds of stone formations. Um, I'm always interested in the character of the material. So obviously, in this case, it's clay. Uh, what informs that? You know, what's in the clay naturally? Um, and not so much about other people's work. In a way, I try not to be influenced, certainly, by. And I guess I can be inspired by seeing other people's work. But it's more about inspired by things that I see in nature, that I try and find the essence of those things rather than trying to replicate that and take the essence of what I'm seeing and draw that and somehow bring that into my own creation. I don't know that I have a particular uh, message to get across with my work. It's like each individual body of work that comes up and sometimes it's uh, a matter of serendipity, how I develop a direction of a particular line of, of creations. Um, often they're abstract, and it's a matter of just thinking more purely about material, texture, form, composition. Um, so that's the way I tend to approach the work in the show as well. For example, a number of the pieces in the show, they're predominantly sculpture, meaning solid forms rather than vessel forms. I believe there's only one vessel form, a very large piece in the show, um, that's sculptural. But uh, I don't consider it sculpture, as it's still a vessel form. Um, but those pieces, the solid ones, are, I guess, influenced, not influenced, but inspired by, um, I guess, geological formations. So hopefully, if you look at some of those solid pieces, you get the feeling of perhaps these works were taken from the ocean. You know, maybe they were found off the Titanic or perhaps inside a volcano. You know, not just because of the surfaces, but the overall feeling of the work has this particular geological organic quality to it. And then I always feel it's my challenge from that point to make it my own work, to add the, the artist's um, uh, attitude to the work. So it's not enough to just find a beautiful stone in nature that might be a beautiful sculpture on its own. You know, nature took millennium to do that. But taking that stone and maybe doing something very minimally to it that takes it to another level that shows that as the artist, the hand is somehow involved in having that piece evolve into an actual creation is important to me. In my case, when I went to Japan when I was 23 and then stayed nine years, um, I had no connection with art, no connection with ceramics, uh, never made a pot, and hadn't looked at much pottery prior to that. So when I came back nine years later to New York, found the property where we live in the Hudson Valley, built the kilns, the studio, uh, basically it was strange because I was making Japanese ceramics, you know, this Jewish kid making Japanese ceramics in upstate New York. It was kind of bizarre. So working through that took a lot. Um, it took years, actually, to kind of get through that part. And I think now, it's now 40 years later, um, I think I'm confident enough in who I am and what I make that I still retain um, the ability, certainly, and the desire to make some of the Japanese forms. So there's something about the tea aesthetic, tea bowl aesthetic, that I still enjoy. It's always a challenge. Uh, I never feel like I've really completely successfully made, say, whatever a perfect tea bowl might be. So it's always a challenge to keep getting better and better with that. It's kind of like my daily training. Um, and sake cups, in a way, the same thing. But then I've let, allowed myself to really just go free and just delve into uh, sculpture. So it took a long time to get to this point. But as I just mentioned, now I feel that um, besides understanding the 
concepts and understanding the materials and the techniques, whether it be the firings or you know the proper clay for this particular series of sculpture. Um, I think I have more vocabulary that I've built up over the years in terms of seeing a lot more in the last 40 years and experiencing a lot more. And all of that now filters back. I'm able to draw from those things to have that combined together in a particular series of sculpture. For me, the important thing is that they're challenging themselves. So whether it's me teaching or anybody else teaching, this that doesn't really matter. It's as long as they step out of their comfort zones. So when I have people come to workshops, first of all, I'd like them to feel comfortable in a way that they're not afraid to try things. That's the first really important thing. And even in their own work, after they go back from the workshop, it's really important to me that they do ch keep challenging themselves. So I think the worst thing, for example, and this is the opposite to your actual question, but if people come and I'm doing a particular workshop on this technique, but they know how to throw and they throw a particular way and they spend most of the weekend say throwing the way they do at home with tweaking a little bit. I don't think anybody gets very much out of that. So for a workshop you really should come ready to be a little bit uncomfortable in terms of challenging yourselves. And I don't care about, I have no secrets and I don't care about teaching a particular technique but I do demonstrate and show those. But for me, my thinking is that as for the participants, if they're just there to learn something you saw in a book, oh, this artist makes a handle with a particular curl a cue, and so I'm going to get that. If that's all you take away from the workshop, basically it's a one-trick pony. So you have one thing that now you can do well, but what do you do with it? You know, you really need to be thinking as a participant how to make these things your own work. So I want people to feel comfortable and uncomfortable at the same time comfortable to step out of their comfort zone and challenging themselves. So when they go back, in a way, at the end of the workshop, for me, if the participants leave with more questions than they had when they first came, it's a success for me. My wife, uh, as, a, as a, I guess not really a mentor, but in a way a teacher, she, her art is food and how she deals with food and ceramics, and she has an artistic I. So the way she might use my vessels or we'll talk about vessels and how she'll create a particular food to go with a particular form that I may make, that helps me a lot. I mean, that's some of my training. I have mentors, many people in my life, a number of them in Japan, who I consider mentors. You know, I perhaps didn't study directly with them, but on all different levels, um, they were mentors to me. And I think about that a lot. Um, and certainly teachers, again, mostly in Japan. I studied at four different places during my nine years, and each of those had a, a very strong lesson to be learned um, during that time. And each one was different. So sometimes it might have been about technique and about understanding clay. Bizen in particular, um, the clay and the wood firing, it's a thousand year old. Uh, tradition that's still being done pretty much the same as it was a thousand years ago. But their attention to clay, clay character, clay character in Japanese is called suchi <laughs> aji. And it's a very important uh, term. And it's uh, something in the West that we tend not to think too much about presently. Maybe uh, Shibata san over at the Starworks is making clays with a lot of character in it. But most people tend to <coughs> use clay that's been pulverized and actually it's taken out all the character of the clay. But when you work in places like Bizen, Shigaraki, Iga, these places are still using the natural clays that have all of the, the great organic matter still in there, which leads to the concept of wabi-sabi and the concept of imperfections that have a beauty of their own. So there's a beauty to the imperfections in nature that I'm always trying to get in my work, or not put into my work, but I'm trying not to take it out of the material. So it's a statement in the finished work, whether it's sculpture or tableware, that aspect of the imperfections are mostly in almost everything I do. It's uh, where I live, the place I chose to be is a, is a big part of my work, actually. So when I came back from Japan after nine years, uh, my folks were living in Westchester, New York. Uh, I stayed there for a few months and I had literally had a map 
and I put a radius, a two hour radius from Manhattan, wanting to be near a, a market, but not wanting to live in a city, because most of my time Japan was spent in the mountains, and I really enjoyed that as a lifestyle. So I had this radius, and every day I would go out talking to realtors, looking at properties, hearing from people about places that may be available. And the place I'm at now was actually a mistake because I was on my way to another property to see about possibly buying a piece of land and got lost in the area I'm in. Uh, I kind of looked around and thought, wow, this has a little of a feeling of where I lived in Japan. I found this beautiful stream on a hillside. I needed the slope for the kiln. Um, I met with the builder who was building a first spec house on this kind of small mountain and he took me down to see the stream which was covered with this magnificent moss, this velvety, beautiful translucent green moss and the water was crystal clear, it was full, all the leaves had fallen down into the bottom of the stream and it looked like this mosaic carpet and I just said, okay, we're, we're here, let's, let's do it. So that's how I chose the property. And the reason that it's important, I wasn't trying to replicate the situation I had in Japan, but I wanted aspects of that. I wanted to be immersed in the middle of nature. I wanted that to reference my work. And I wanted that to be part of my life. I didn't want to <coughs> separate the two. It wasn't like I went out to work and came back and lived in this environment. The environment is who I am, and it's what I do, and it's where I do it.